The last structural element that we'll cover in uh, 347 uh, are foundations. Uh, these, of course, are the things that keep the building from falling through the earth. We've calculated how loads flow through a fairly simple building frame through slabs, beams and girders, columns. And now we have to figure out how to take those very big loads, the whole weight of the building, uh, and distribute them over the ground that we're putting our building on. Um, we talked before about uh, collecting the loads from slabs and bringing them into columns and the kind of pair of things that we look at. First of all, um, how we can design two-way slabs or actually infinite way slabs ideally so that um, the loads are traveling in as many different directions as we can get. We're taking advantage of the resistance to deflection in uh, at least two axes. And then we also talked about the problem of punching shear. If we're trying to uh, distill these loads into the smallest possible column that we can, um, we run into the problem of basically like a, a knitting needle through a birthday cake, right? We need to find a way to keep the needle from just slicing right through the, the cake, in this case, the column from slicing through the slab. So we have things like mushroom columns and drop panels that increase the interface between the shape of the column, the shape of the slab to help us do that. Now, when we're designing foundations, we basically flip that problem over, right? Now we're taking loads from these needle thin columns and we're basically trying to spread them out over uh, an area of soil or sand or gravel or rock that can support that load. The problem, of course, uh, is that the earth is uh, often porous, it's often spongy, uh, and if we try to just set those columns onto the ground, what we find is we get the same problem, right? We get punching shear, in this case, through the earth instead of through a, a concrete slab. So we have a similar condition. We're taking uh, point loads. We're trying to spread them out over an area. It's exactly the opposite of uh, taking uh, an, an area load and trying to put it into a point load. And the way we'll do that is that we'll look at the mechanics of the soil itself, whatever we're putting the building on, and we'll try to figure out a way to develop Again, multiple infinite numbers of load paths so that eventually uh, it's not just the patch of ground beneath us, but you can think of it as like trying to make it be the whole crust of the earth that's supporting our building. The way we do that is we look for soil that has what we call good bearing geometry. So if you put the soil under a microscope, what we're looking for uh, are particles of soil that uh, can compress together, in other words, that are hard, uh, and that develop friction between them. Uh, in other words, that are rough, so that when we put a weight onto the soil, all of these particles end up locking together and basically forming a very, very sturdy base uh, for the building. If we can find bedrock, that job is done for us, right? Nature has done that, either through uh, hundreds of thousands of years of uh, deposits and compaction, that is, a rock like sandstone or limestone, uh, or if we're super lucky, uh, some sort of volcanic action, right? We'll find an igneous rock like granite that's totally monolithic uh, and that has a really, really good uh, bearing capacity. Here uh, in Iowa, uh, in the Midwest, we have all of this kind of glacial till, uh, often up to uh, 20, 30, 40 feet uh, of this nice loamy soil that's very good for growing things in not so good for putting a building on. And so very often we either need to dig through that or we need to do something to the soil uh, to increase its bearing capacity. This is what organic soil looks like or, or this is what uh, liquefied soil looks like. Instead of those uh, hard kind of rough uh, surfaces that lock against one another and provide uh, this good monolithic bearing. Um, when we're talking about uh, a soil like sand or organics, we're talking about something more like a ball pit. And if you remember from being a kid, um, a ball pit is very easy to kind of move a load down through, right? It's essentially a fluid just with big particles instead of molecules. Here, when we put a load onto a soil that, uh, stratum that, look, that works like a ball pit, um, those particles of soil can move around, they can redistribute. And what we find is that the soil spreads out uh, and the loads are able to more easily pass through the soil. Obviously, we, we do not want that. So essentially, we want gravel pits, 
uh, not ball pits when we're looking for, uh, for, for soils to put our building on. And we do this in a couple of ways. Um, one is we uh, have the uh, foundation contractor do what's called a, a slump test. So we'll excavate a little bit of the soil and we'll literally pile it up uh, and we'll see what it does. And if the soil flows, in other words, if the soil basically is a fluid, if it is silt uh, or clay or mud, the slump test will go poorly. The soil will slump quite a bit. It will flow out, uh, it will spread out. We'll know that we can't really put any great weight onto it. If on the other hand, we pile the soil up and it holds a, a, like a pyramidal shape, then we know it's a good foundation soil. This is something like uh, rock or gravel or what we call hard pan, which is organic soil that's been compressed over thousands and thousands of years. So it forms like a very, very, very stiff uh, clay. Those have good bearing capacity. The soil doesn't get out of the way. The particles tend to lock together uh, and form a, a monolithic uh, base underneath our, our foundations. Somewhere in the middle, we get something like sand. And depending on how much water is in the sand, depending on what the particles of sand look like, uh, it can be a good or a poor soil. But notice that the, the, the slump test is basically in like pseudo laboratory conditions. It's telling us something about how the soil is going to behave under load. And we want it to hold its shape. We do not want it to flow and, and, and to spread out. We uh, have some general rules of thumb for the allowable bearing loads on a whole range of soil types. So you'll notice that if we try to build basically on uh, quicksand or a swamp, um, we don't get a whole lot of bearing capacity, one and a half tons per square foot uh, on silt uh, or clay. Fill is what we think of normally as organic soil. If you go out into your backyard in Iowa and dig up a bunch of soil, this is essentially fill. And notice that it's pretty weak as well, right? Three tons per square foot. And this we know from experience, right? Our feet will sink down into loose soil or wet soil pretty easily. When we start to get up into uh, hard clay, uh, coarse or rough sand, uh, and especially into gravel, what we start to find is that we build up some fairly serious bearing capacity, uh, double or even three times that of simple organics. And these are good soils for basically uh, low to mid-rise construction. We can spread the weight of a building out over a patch of gravel. And if it's only three or four stories tall, we can expect that gravel to actually hold the, hold the building up. Up here, we get into things like hard pan. Hard pan is, a, is usually a, a lower stratum of soil. We have to dig off a, a lot of fill to get to it. Uh, but the way that it forms is actually that fill over time gets wet, dries out, gets compacted by weather and loading, various events. And over the course of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, that soil actually forms a pretty strong bearing stratum. And you can see that um, even what we call poorly cemented hard pan or hard pan that's still a little bit loose has a pretty good bearing capacity. We can go up to about 12 tons per square foot uh, if that hard pan has been really compressed well. And then of course, what we would really like, especially when we're building tall buildings, where we're pull, uh, piling up uh, story after story, we'd really want rock. And there you can see that we get from 20 all the way up to 60 tons per square foot. So think about this, at the high end of the, of the uh, soils spectrum, sound rock, we've got 20 or even 40 times the bearing capacity of soil that we might find like right at the surface. This is really important. What this means is that typically, the taller the building is, the deeper the foundations need to be because the better soils, bedrock, hard pan, even sometimes gravel, uh, are rarely found right at the surface, right? We have to get rid of some poor, friable, uh, loose soil. We have to get rid uh, sometimes of some intermediate soil that might be fine for a mid-rise building, but won't be fine for a high-rise building. We've got to get down uh, to strata that have this uh, bearing capacity that's up in the 10, 15, 20 ton range if we're going to put a really tall building uh, onto our patch of ground. The more sophisticated way that we know what's underneath us is we have a geotechnical engineer come out uh, and do what's called a boring test. In a boring test, they literally will take sample cores, they'll go down 40, 50, maybe even 80 or 100 feet, and they'll literally pull up a whole long cylinder of soil 
that they can then apply what are called hammer tests to. So seeing what it takes to break that soil up. And we'll get a report, as you see here, that gives us uh, a record of how many hammer blows it took to, um, to break the soil up. Uh, we'll typically get uh, an estimate of the bearing capacity, and we'll get a description of what that soil is. And using that, we can make a clever decision about whether we need very, very large foundations that are shallower. In other words, spreading the load of the building out over a, a, a weaker stratum of soil, or how far down we need to go to get foundations down to an economical size, right? To take what are basically the, the, the same thing as a shear cap or a column cap and a slab, flipping that around, we call those footings. How large do our footings need to be? And we'll know that based on how strong the, the soil is. If we find that we have really bad soil, uh, we can do some things to uh, make it stronger, to give it some additional bearing capacity. The most common version of this is what we call cut and fill. So we may be excavating a building, we'll literally take the organic soil off of that and we'll put it someplace else on the site. We'll sculpt the site so that our building is sitting on a lower stratum of soil uh, and we'll use the organic soil that we've dug up to build uh, a, a, a bluff or a berm uh, or a hill somewhere else on the site. We try to keep the soil on site because it's expensive, of course, to truck out hundreds of tons of soil. We have to find some place to put it. We have to uh, hire the, the, uh, the trucks to carry all of that dirt. Much, much easier if we can just push the dirt uh, around on the site. And uh, structures like basketball arenas in particular, where we are trying to play around with levels anyway, this can be a relatively easy way of doing that. So here, this is the, the UNI arena uh, in Cedar Falls. And you can see that basically they've taken the bowl of the arena, scooped the dirt out of that, and use that on uh, three sides of the arena to actually build the landscape up. So that we're coming in, we're, we're going up gently to the top of the uh, stands and then diving down into the earth. And the sum total of dirt here, the volume that gets scooped up is equal to the volume that gets dumped out. Uh, and that way we keep all the soil on the site. The arena itself can sit on relatively good soil that's uh, down further in the earth. And we can build up uh, the, the soil around the exterior of the building where maybe we have lighter structural loads. We can also uh, just uh, sort of attack the soil itself and we can do the work that nature does over thousands of years to create hard pan to make essentially man-made hard pan. And we do that by what we call densification and compaction. So usually liquefying the soil, adding water to the soil, and then using these uh, vibrating hammers or sometimes using something like a, a, a roller to go over the site and literally press the soil down to make hard pan out of loose soil. And because we've densified it, uh, the soil then has uh, a more monolithic character and it can spread loads out over a, a much wider volume uh, of soil. Uh, we can also uh, do what we call surcharging. If we uh, have clay in particular, uh, clay is a plastic material. It flows, and it will flow throughout the life of the building if we're not careful. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to squeeze as much of the water and also to basically uh, uh, take it from a plastic material into a solid material by coming in and before we start constructing on that soil, actually loading the soil to what we expect the building will weigh. We can do this either by dumping more soil on top. We can use... Uh, concrete or pig iron, something to actually sit on top of the soil and let it kind of press the water out, densify the clay, turn it into a more solid material that will have more bearing capacity and it will also not move over time, we hope. Um, this is less common these days, but it was fairly common in the 19th century uh, that you would see construction sites where before uh, work actually began, there would be these giant piles of pig iron that would literally be trying to compress the soil so they could build foundations uh, that, could, that could support their building. Other things that we can do, we can actually take liquid cement, we can inject it into the soil. Uh, we can um, do that to either add cohesion, to tie the soil together, or if we find that there are underground voids. This happens sometimes with 
uh, limestone. If we have bedrock that's limestone and water has gotten in, there'll be caverns uh, underneath. We can actually inject uh, concrete into, into those caverns to, to, uh, to uh, prevent them from collapsing then when we load on top of them. We can uh, drain the soil, uh, excavate around it, add gravel, add drainage tile, take the water out of it so that we are uh, reducing the kind of lubrication between soil particles, uh, making them uh, have better, uh, a better friction fit. We can take unstable earth and we can literally drive piles uh, into it. You see this a lot uh, next to rivers or in maritime construction. Uh, there'll be a pile driver out there often for weeks at a time just hammering piles into the soil to basically hold the soil in place to keep it from flowing uh, along with the, the water that, that's above it. If we set up uh, vibration machines on these piles, that will actually compact the soil uh, around the pile. It will shake it, uh, the soil will compress up to a depth of about 40 feet. We can make often silt uh, or clay into a much stronger stratum of uh, soil. And then finally, we can control where water goes on the site. We can do this by installing underground membranes to channel water. We can also uh, remove soil, add a porous soil like gravel to let water uh, drain away from particularly sensitive areas of the site. So the essential uh, thing that we do to calculate these, very, very simple um, load over area calculation. So it's a lot like our formulas for axial loading. We look at the uh, bearing capacity of the soil, usually in pounds per square foot. We look at the amount of load that we're putting onto that soil. Usually we measure that in tons. One ton is 2,000 pounds. Uh, and then we see uh, how large our foundations, how much area we need to spread that load out over uh, to make it work. So here, uh, if we have a, a soil that can only resist half a ton per, uh, per square inch, in this case, we'll say, uh, how large do our foundations need to be to carry a load of 10 tons? Well, we know pretty much right away that um, if we put up, just put that load onto thin columns, uh, the columns will just slice right through the, the soil, right? the knitting needle and birthday cake problem. If we do a quick calculation though, um, what we'll try to do is we'll try to take that load, that 10 ton load, and spread it out over a larger area, being careful that we don't just take the shear problem into the foundation. Right, We have to design that foundation so that uh, the punching shear of the column won't uh, 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 cause failure in whatever footing we build. Um, and then we basically want to spread that consolidated or that point load out over as wide an area of soil as we think it'll take uh, to, to make it work. So the calculation is basically like this. Here we have our 10 ton weight. We have two columns, so there are five tons in each column. We are probably sizing a beam and a column uh, in here first. But when we find out that we have this five ton load on each of the columns, what we need to do is we need to look at the bearing capacity, 0.5 tons per square inch, and then we need to calculate how many square inches it will take with that uh, capacity to bear up to, a, to the weight that we're putting on it. And in this case, uh, at 0.5 tons per square inch, it'll take 10 of those, 10 times 0.5, to equal five tons. So each one of those columns has to sit basically on a 10 square inch or about you know, a, a, a five inch by two inch rectangle, uh, roughly a kind of three and a half by three and a half inch uh, footing, right? Not, not very big. That's got some, a, a little bit of capacity, right? For one 10 ton weight, uh, that'll kind of work. We have to though be careful that we know what's going on throughout the, the soil stratum. So, for example, if we are building on limestone, limestone might be very strong, but we might have uh, caverns underneath. And uh, even if the soil, even if there's just a pocket of slightly weaker soil, we'll end up with this situation called differential settlement, where soil in one area that might have a higher capacity, a higher resistance, uh, unbalances the building, right? The, the, the column the foundation on the left, in this case, is over a weaker spot or a, or a cavern. Um, it actually kind of slightly collapses. It may compress that material more. It may fall through a, a void in the soil. We end up with the building settling differentially. This area is settling more than this area. And as you can imagine, this starts to wreak havoc with our, all of our structural connections and all of our structural elements. 
Uh, for one thing here, we have a, an office floor maybe where all of our pens roll to one side of the office. We might notice the slanting floors as we're walking around. Um, but this also can be a problem uh, with the connections, right? Connections that aren't designed to take that kind of rotation uh, may get damaged, right? May not function so well anymore. Um, most famous example of differential settlement is the baptistry tower uh, of the cathedral in Pisa. Um, this, of course, is a, a tower that's become famous for its lean, um, but this lean uh, has happened gradually over time. It's only in the last 10 years that engineers have come up with a way to actually stop the settlement from continuing. Uh, of course, if the building continues to lean, eventually its center of gravity gets out from ov over its footings uh, and, and the building just falls over. But this is what differential settlement looks like uh, in the worst possible case. And as it happened, this was exactly a case where the soil underground changed from one half of the baptistry to another. Uh, the builders at the time had no idea that this was the case. And even though the, the foundation was adequate to support uh, the, the building with the stronger soil, the weaker soil, it was obviously not. And so the, the building started to lean even before it was completed. And you can see that they changed course right about here. Uh, they, they realized that the tower was leaning and they actually kind of reset the building so that these upper stories uh, are at a slight angle to the lower stories. Right? So that tells you how bad the problem was. The, the foundation started failing even before the, the baptistry was complete. Now, here in the Midwest, we also have the opposite problem. Uh, if we don't build our foundation deep enough, uh, we are building uh, on top of soil that is damp and that can freeze. So when water freezes, it expands and the soil expands too. And it may be as much as two or three inches uh, in, the, in, the, in the great Midwest. So what happens is if we have one bit of foundation that is on uh, a, a freezing level of soil, another uh, foundation that's maybe inside a building where the soil is heated up or that goes deeper to a, a layer of soil that doesn't freeze, here in Iowa, that's about four feet below ground. Um, what we find is that the what we call a frost heave will actually pick a portion of the building up. Now, this is differential settlement, right? This is just negative settlement. So we have all of the problems that we have in uh, the, the kind of positive differential settlement, right? Where one, or negative differential settlement, where one half actually drops. The problem here is that then in the spring, when the ground thaws out, the building settles back down, right? The frost heave goes away. And over time, this is basically a repeated load, a repetitive load that's going to stress and strain the connections and all of the structural elements in a dynamic way, a way that we maybe hadn't designed for. Over time, that can weaken structural elements, that can weaken connections, uh, and we, we find that the building actually ends up being more flexible than we want it to be. So we put foundations below what we call the frost line. And the frost line will be kind of general knowledge for most uh, communities. Like I said, here in the Midwest, four feet is uh, often a kind of standard depth that we want to dig our foundations to minimum to get below the level uh, where the soil actually freezes. Um, you've probably seen this in old houses. Sometimes you see especially front porches uh, that might be on shallower footings than a, a house with a basement. And the front porch will look like it's literally like falling off of the, of the front of the house sometimes accompanied with a clear shear cracks, right? This is a, a clear sign that differential settlement is happening, usually because of, of this frost heave behavior. And here's a really great example of a differential settlement. Uh, Europe, so a, a house that's considerably older than what we're used to, and you can imagine what the floors are like in here. This is probably more due to uh, inconsistencies in the soil uh, than in frost heaves because the, the, the whole house seems to be built on one foundation. And uh, we also uh, like to put our, make our foundations deep because we get differential settlements sometimes uh, that comes with the movement of soil uh, when it's fully hydrated or when it uh, is saturated with rain and actually becomes a fluid itself. Um, here a, a really famous example in China, uh, uh, high-rise housing under construction, uh, a huge rainstorm undermines the soil that it was built on on one side. And this is a case of like complete differential settlement, right? There's no support 
in this foundation, the surcharge uh, from rain behind it uh, actually broke the foundation systems. We'll talk about this system in particular, piling uh, in the next video. And with nothing to support it on one side of the building uh, and with no resistance to the kind of lateral forces that it's getting from this underground river of water, um, the building actually falls over. Right? This is obviously differential settlement uh, that we want to avoid at all costs. Okay, in our next video, we'll look at the strategies we go through to, uh, first of all, find uh, and use or exploit a stratum of soil that is sufficiently strong to carry our building. Uh, and we'll also look at some techniques that we use uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to support not just kind of mid-rise buildings, but also really tall buildings. And what we do in particular um, when we find that there aren't stratas of soil that, that we can use anywhere convenient, how we actually get down uh, to bedrock if that's, if that's far away. We'll do a quick example to show how the calculations work, uh, and then we'll call it a day and we'll move on in the last lecture uh, to reviewing all of our structural elements together.